Well, well, this was quite a surprise. I was sent this study by a number of people in the physiotic community. So I read it, I analyzed it, I brooded over it, and then quickly scrambled to get this video out because there's a tremendous amount to cover here. Is it true? Is niacin causing heart disease? I'm talking about this study wherein the researchers identified a sinister role of niacin in potentially causing heart disease. Okay, so they used data from several groups of people, including validation cohorts, and wanted to know if we control for lipoproteins that are linked to heart disease, blood pressure, diabetes, and several other factors. Why is there a residual risk of heart disease? Which is a great question. Why do people experience heart disease if we're controlling for all these factors? Well, that isn't to say that these factors don't play a role. Researchers acknowledge that heart disease rates are typically improved when controlling for these factors, but heart disease still persists. So why? So to find out, they did an untargeted metabolomics screen, which means that they probed the blood from these groups of people for thousands of molecules to find where there might be an abnormal rise or drop in certain molecules. Ultimately, they found the usual suspects. So they ignored those, but focused on a suspicious group of unknown molecules. They're unknown because they aren't defined by this metabolomics experiment, but can be defined by another experiment called mass spectrometry. Mass spec, which is what we abbreviate it as the too cool to say the full name scientists. So mass spec allows us to figure out the weight as well as composition of the molecules by determining the mass to chemical charge of the molecule. And what they found is that these molecules are tightly involved in the niacin and NAD metabolism pathway. These molecules are called N1-methyl-2-pyridone-5-carboxamide and N1-methyl-4-pyridone-3-carboxamide, which are, I'm sure, on the top of everyone's baby name list for twins. If you'll allow me, I'll abbreviate them to 2PY and 4PY. Anyway, if we zoom into our metabolism of B vitamins, we know that niacin feeds into this generation of NAD, which is a common molecule in our cells involved in a huge number of cellular processes from DNA repair to metabolizing fats and much more. On the other hand, NAD is then converted to nicotinamide. And when nicotinamide is catabolized, it turns into 2PY and 4PY. Dun, 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 the horror. <laughs> anyway, joking aside, the researchers quantified the risk of MACE, which stands for Major Adverse Cardiovascular Events, which is a grouping of cardiovascular events in composite. If we look at the data, we can see some of the worry. Here, we're seeing the amount of MACE, so the higher, the worse. The horizontal axis shows the time elapsed, and the Q4 is the people with the highest circulating 2PY and 4PY levels. Clearly, you can see the red, the Q4, with the greatest blood concentration of 2PY and 4PY associates with the greatest levels of MACE. Now, this data does not account for other factors like blood pressure, cholesterol-containing lipoproteins, diabetes, and so on. So they also show us an adjusted model accounting for those factors. Reading this data, we have the amount of risk on the bottom, the horizontal axis, and then we have our different 2PY and 4PY concentrations listed on the vertical. The Q4 is again our highest concentration. If the lines move to the right, there is an increased risk confirmed by statistical analysis via p-value for those stats nerds out there like myself. The black line is the unadjusted data, so just straight correlation between these niacin and NAD metabolites and MACE risk. The red line is the association when controlling for the aforementioned CVD risk factors, blood pressure, diabetes, etc. As we can see, they both indicate risk, even when other factors are accounted for. Now, I won't show you the data for time's sake, but they show the same results when separating out these metabolites. So when just looking at 2PY or just looking at 4PY, confirming the data that we just went over. Okay. If you've been supplementing with niacin or NAD boosters, you might be uh, sweating a bit under the collar. Not looking too bright, is it? Well, 
there might be a light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe. I don't want to promise anything, so keep your seatbelt fastened because we might also be headed for a wall. So there's this link between these niacin and NAD metabolites and cardiovascular disease. But the researchers took several more steps by performing a GWAS or gene-wide association study, which essentially finds the association between these metabolites and different genes across tens of thousands of individuals. And as we can see, the GWAS picked up a gene that was tightly related to both of these metabolites. That gene is ACMSD, found on your chromosome 2. Then, if we take a closer look around that gene, we see one mutation is highlighted called RS1049 Each one of those dots is a mutation, but some belong to other genes and some don't reach significance. So they focused on the most prominent one, this one. Full disclosure, uh, they found another mutation that was also tightly related to 4PY metabolite, but since they both shared this ACMSD gene mutation, they focused on this one. Okay, so we now know that these metabolites are linked to this gene and this gene mutation called a single nucleotide polymorphism. So you might be wondering what this gene does and why it's important and why it matters to us figuring out if niacin and NAD is poisoning our hearts. For that, the researchers figured out how this gene affects these metabolites by injecting a small hairpin RNA into mice. This hairpin RNA, which technically, for my molecular biologists out there, was delivered through an adenovirus, will bind to the RNA produced by the ACMSD gene and inhibit it from being produced into a protein. Okay, I can't help myself, so I'm gonna explain how this molecular biology works in case you're interested, if you're not interested, skip to this timestamp and I'll be as brief as possible. I'll meet you over there with my posse of fellow nerds. Essentially, the researchers injected a virus containing the genetic information to produce an RNA molecule. If you don't remember, here's a brief rundown on RNA and genes. When your genes are read or expressed to generate the protein that genes hold the information for, it first has to be transcribed into an RNA molecule, which is then converted to a protein that then functions within your cells. So the liver cells of these mice have been infected to produce an RNA called a silencing RNA. But instead of going on to create a protein, this silencing RNA is designed to target the RNA produced by the ACSMND gene. It will literally bind to it with the help of a protein called RISC and degrade it instead of allowing the ACMSD RNA to continue to produce the ACMSD protein and serve its function in the cell. Okay, so these researchers inject these mice with this RNA that blocks the production of the ACMSD gene, which we can see here. The amount of gene RNA is dramatically reduced in red, called a knockdown. And what happens to the metabolites, the 2PY and 4PY? They increase, and by a lot as well, at least for the 2PY. So there's this connection between the gene and the metabolites. This tells us that if the gene is not functioning correctly, like, I don't know, from a mutation maybe, that a person's 2PY and 4PY levels might rise. Now, we understand the link but how exactly does 2PY and 4PY lead to worse MACE outcomes, worse cardiovascular disease? They figured that out too. I'm telling you, these researchers did a lot of work. They did a number of experiments, but I'm going to show you the salient one because I'd like to wrap this up with some bigger picture takeaways for you, including a few areas that I think the researchers actually missed the mark. What they did was inject mice with 2PY and 4PY, which is a way to get the cause and effect relationship instead of speculating on possible other confounding factors. What they then measured was the amount of leukocyte adhesion. Leukocytes or immune cells will roll and bind onto cells that line your blood vessels. These cells, called endothelial cells, will express and produce proteins that allow the leukocytes to adhere to them, like anchors or attachment points. An overabundance of these attachment points, in this case a protein called VCAM, the more of these immune cells bind to the endothelial cells to invade past the endothelial layer into the subendothelium which is where plaque begins to grow. 
There are other factors involved in this process, but one is inflammation, these immune cells. And if inflammation is increased by more of these VCAM proteins being expressed on the endothelium, the more of these leukocytes will adhere and potentially invade into the subendothelium. So, is that what they showed? Yes. As we see here, we're measuring adherent cells, so the number of leukocytes that are at that adhesion stage. The higher, the worse in this context. Interestingly, 2PY injection did not lead to this effect, but 4PY injection did, if we compare them against the control condition there, which did not receive 2PY or 4PY injection. So this might imply that 2PY is a passenger to the problem, and the real problematic culprit is 4PY, the reason earlier data showed a relationship when just looking at 2PY is because that is not adjusted for 4PY concentrations. So it stands to reason that they might both increase similarly and inextricably. All right, all that leaves us <laughs> pretty numb, I imagine. Well, let's avoid the Green Day Novocaine and see what we can determine from this data and how it fits into the grand scheme of things. Well. We have some evidence that having a deficient enzyme, ACSMD, is linked to increased levels of these metabolites, especially 4PY. We also know that 4PY tracks increased cardiovascular risk, even when accounting for certain other factors like diabetes, LDL, blood pressure, and more. Now, this gene, ACSMD, is part of an ancillary niacin NAD metabolism pathway related to tryptophan. Usually, tryptophan would be converted to acetyl-CoA by partly this ACSMD enzyme, which then allows acetyl-CoA to enter the mitochondria to be used for energy. Fine. However, if ACSMD is out of commission, tryptophan metabolites are probably incapable of being converted to acetyl-CoA, so they get shuttled to this NAD synthesis in a pathway called the price handler pathway. Ultimately, what you need to know is if this ACSMD enzyme is deficient in some way, then you have excess substrate to produce NAD. But did you know that not all mutations of this ACSMD enzyme lead to higher 4PY? Some mutations of the very same location on the gene, the same single nucleotide polymorphism that we discussed earlier, do not impede its function and may actually increase its function. You might also be interested to know that the people included in this study most likely had some form of heart disease already. And if you look at the data again from these individuals, is it possible that the people in the Q4 have the deficiency in this ACSMD enzyme or some other related enzyme and therefore they see these high 4PY values? Because notice how three other groups do not have overly high 4PY values and they do not differ in risk. So it may be that if you are in the majority of people with this functional enzyme, you may not see these increases in 4PY. We can't say based on this data, but we can say something far more powerful. It stands to reason that even with a functional version of this enzyme, if we supplement with extremely high doses of niacin, we might still raise our 4PY regardless. Unfortunately, the researchers mentioned that niacin studies show no positive effects on cardiovascular outcomes. But uh, notice how I frame that, no positive effects. If niacin leads to this devastating increase in 4PY, we'd likely expect worse outcomes, not neutral. Overall, this study indicates a potential new mechanism of cardiovascular disease through 4PY, but does it condemn niacin as a cardiovascular disease risk? My answer is no, I'm not worried. And that's because the researchers made a mistake that I almost made several months ago when I analyzed many studies to find out if niacin protects against cardiovascular disease. I'll explain the mistake and show you the direct effect of niacin on cardiovascular disease in this linked video. I'll see you over there. Bye.